Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, on COVID career advice and navigating the pandemic job market. Uh, while we are meeting in a virtual space, I want to acknowledge that the place that we Canadians call home uh, are the traditional lands of the First Nation, Inuit and Métis people. Um, I'm Jennifer Lau, the president of the Toronto Asia Pacific Youth Council, acronym TAPYC, and we are uh, part of the initiative of the Asia Pacific Foundation dedicated to engaging Canadian youth um, uh, to Asia. So uh, we are a volunteer group of students and young professionals under 35. And if you do enjoy today's event, uh, please consider our call for applications to join the 2021 Council. Applications are due on January 8th. To learn more and apply, uh, visit our website at www.asiapacific. Uh, dot ca and if you click on the about us tab you'll find a link that says join us um, at this time i'd also like to invite you to fill out the poll questions that will pop up on your screen shortly so that we can get to know you a bit more as well as uh, understand the demographic I would also like to acknowledge that we have some attendees joining us all the way from Vancouver, from the Vancouver Asia Pacific Youth Council, our counterpart on the West Coast. So welcome. Uh, today's webinar focuses on a discussion on how recent graduates and young professionals can navigate the job market that we are currently facing and how to develop uh, your career and continue to advance professionally despite the limitations and restrictions due to COVID-19. Uh, the experts uh, we have today will share some job seeking strategies and career advice that they receive throughout their career and their journeys. So I'm sure you'll benefit very much. Uh, the webinar is actually inspired by insights from our two part podcast series entitled have your say, which was uh, introduced this year. Uh, we focused on how international students coped with and were affected by the pandemic. Uh, and just a side note that this webinar will be recorded and uploaded onto our website in the future. So a little disclaimer there. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce you to the moderator for today's discussion, uh, Garang Dar, a member of the TAPYC since 2019. Garang was the 2020 MBA valedictorian at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto and the elected president of the Student Council during his term there. Uh, this year, he also headed a management consulting firm focusing on providing strategic advice to small and medium-sized enterprises across Canada. So it is my honor to pass the floor to Grant to introduce our speakers and more about us. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for such a wonderful and warm introduction. Um, so today's conversation, like Jennifer mentioned, is a continuation of the dialogue, which was featured in our podcast series, Have Your Say, um, where, you know, we highlighted some of the struggles uh, for both Canadian and international students during COVID. Um, 2020 has certainly been a very trying year for all of us. We saw the world come to a standstill um, and companies, organizations, governments, students, young professionals, all of us were quickly forced to uh, adapt to a new normal where you know, online platforms became our offices, our classrooms, our playgrounds. And um, this pandemic put a tremendous amount of pressure on the educational institutions, uh, medical facilities and governments. And to discuss some of these topics, um, today and their lasting impact. It's my honor to introduce this esteemed and illustrious panel. Uh, we're joined today by uh, some extremely talented people. And I want to thank each uh, one of our panelists for, for taking the time out from their busy schedules and joining us today. Um, um, I would like to welcome um, Ms. Lisa DeWild, Mr. Victor Thomas, and uh, Dr. Natalia Mikhailova. Now, I would like to talk a little bit about how um, um, you know, all of their work and their contribution, and we can potentially, you know, uh, go to each of them um, and ask a couple of questions. So, um, Ms. Lisa DeWild is a well-known Canadian media executive and a business leader. Um, she served as the CEO of TVO from 2005 to 2019, uh, prior to which she was the uh, president and CEO of Astral Television. Uh, she's been a partner at a law firm and uh, a legal counsel for the Canadian Radio Television. 
uh, and Telecommunications Commission. Um, she's been recognized for her work in public policy and serves as a director on a number of boards in the public and private sectors. And um, she's now an adjunct professor at the Schulich School of Business uh, MBA program. Um, welcome, welcome, Lisa. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mr. Victor Thomas, who's currently the president and CEO of the Canada-India Business Council, um, he assumed the role earlier this year in April, so I'm sure he has a couple of tips for us on how to start a new job in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, previously, he held the position of the vice president for the Prairie Region uh, for the Asia-Pacific Foundation of Canada. He's worked with high-growth private sector companies across Canada and Australia, um, and he's been on the board of directors for um, Sask Energy, Sask which is Saskatoon's um, natural gas distribution utility. Um, extremely um, you know, talented person, and he's been the youngest person ever to serve in the position um, um, for the Chamber's uh, 30, 130 uh, plus year history. Uh, welcome, Victor, it's a pleasure. Great to be here, thank you. Yeah, and uh, last but certainly not the least, Dr. Natalia Miklova. Uh, she has a background in engineering, chemistry, and design. Um, she's a graduate of Etobicoke School of Arts, has a BSc in pharmaceutical chemistry and a PhD degree in chemical engineering from the University of Toronto. Um, and her PhD work involves the development of uh, novel devices and adaptable wireless networks for um, air pollution monitoring and targets major unmet needs, uh, access to reliable, low cost and high time resolution devices for measuring the air we breathe. Uh, she's the CEO and founder of Weave Air, as we can um, as we uh, find, and she uh, started a research initiative to develop technologies that would not only track air pollution, but also purify the air we breathe. Um, welcome, welcome Dr. Natalia. Thank you very much, great to be here. Great, so um, just, uh, you know, I would um, want to really understand from, from all of you, you're all you know, distinguished um, in, your in your fields um, from, the year that we've seen, uh, and we've got somebody from the education, um, somebody from government, somebody from the entrepreneurship here. Um, how do you describe the year that's happened, uh, especially from a perspective of a student and you know a young job seeking professional? And what are some of the tips that you would have for navigating this and you know looking um, at 2021? What are the things that they can do? Um, Lisa, could we start with you, please? Thanks, uh, Garan. It's, it is undoubtedly the big question that we all are grappling with. It's been an unbelievably tough year. And to be entering uh, one's career, you know, it's a really daunting time. That being said, I do think that one of the advantages we will look back on when we look at this time frame is that some of the really big shifts that needed to happen in a lot of key uh, sectors, health, education, to name but two, were accelerated. And, you know, I think that if one can have a little bit of the patience, but also the real determination to see through, uh, you know, the next months, we will, in fact, come out with amazingly uh, strong people making a huge contribution to making our world way better than it was when we went into this. And so it's, it's choppy and I have unbelievable um, optimism when I look at the strength of people who are hitting the workforce now. But I think it's incumbent on all of us to like roll up our sleeves and make sure that people get the support uh, so that they can build those successful lives. That's why I'm here. That's that's a great response, and I guess um, uh, you know pace, patience and determination is definitely something that we need in trying to learn the best that we can from the situation that we have at, uh, at hand, and then trying to realign ourselves to the future. Um, Victor, in your experience, starting um, this this role uh, in the middle of a pandemic, um, any any advice on you know young job seeking professionals on how they should um, really be navigating this? Thank you, Garang, and thank you for uh, having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, I would just say uh, three specific things. One is the world is changing faster than ever before. Uh, McKinsey just did a global survey of executives and they mentioned the acceleration of the digitization of the customers and supply chains. And that has moved by three to four years, right? Like this has only been going on for 10 months and we've seen such an acceleration. 
And then the share of digital enabled products and their portfolios has accelerated by a shocking seven years. So what has been taking place is so disruptive to not to everyone and technology has been a big piece of that. So those that are coming into the workforce um, are coming in at a very unusual and unique time, but it's unusual and unique time for everyone. And those of you that are quick to adapt, quick to make, be creative and, and have opportunity to take risk, I think it's actually a very unique time. Two, I would just say, there's a lot of needs. There's a lot of people that are hurting. And you, uh, most of you on this that are working and those that are um, just finishing school have so much skills and abilities and talents. And I just hope that you genuinely look to serve others because there, you know, in doing that, you also build um, skills, you build networks, you build uh, understanding in terms of um, your careers and, and the context in which we're in, where there's a lot of people that are, that are in need. And then third, I would just say, um, you know, we, we hear the stats and we understand the isolation that we have to be in because of, of COVID, but you know, more than ever, uh, a lot of people thought that because you go to events and you hand out, you know, 50 business cards, you're quote unquote networking. And I would just say that we need more than ever to build uh, meaningful relationships. And that has, that is going to be done very differently now uh, than it was a year ago. But I think that's actually more important than ever. And for young professionals to be able to have those connections, to understand the opportunity, you know, um, going back to some very unusual ways in the last few years, but even you know the very basis of, of sending a handwritten note or sending a thoughtful text, checking in with people, those things just go a very long way on the business side and also on the personal side in these unusual and unstable times. Thank you, Victor. That was a great answer. Um, and just quoting Satya Nadella earlier, he said that um, years worth of technological um, advancement and digitization has happened in a matter of months. Um, so I completely agree that, um, I mean, we are a living example of this. We're all talking to, you know, people across the world through a digital platform. Um, so, uh, Dr. Natalia, any tips on, you know, from your perspective on how students should really embrace this change and, you know, leverage the most out of this to come out on top? Yeah, no, that that's, uh, I completely agree with what was said earlier by Lisa and Victor. It's such a great point made about, you know, how it's important for us to maintain re resilience and also to learn from, from this, uh, you know, challenge that we are coming through. I, I'm actually also a fairly recent graduate. Like I, I formally graduated in December 2018 from my PhD. Uh, and so it, it, it was quite a year for me uh, over the past year. Uh, so one thing, there is a few things that uh, I, I would suggest. Uh, one thing that I, I noticed this in environment is, it, you know, it, it has put a lot of strain on people, but it have also kind of accelerated at, at which point, uh, accelerated in the way that we are learning things. So there has been so many, you know, opportunities that open up to kind of upskill yourself to, you know, become better uh, and get uh, certain, um, you know, skill sets and qualities that you are looking for in there. And there has been so many opportunities that open up to do this in a very uh, low cost, um, whether it is by, you know, getting uh, opportunity to work with companies because right now even though it might look like the job market is very is very uh, difficult but there are so many um, I mean very innovative uh, startups that are recruiting including our company so in case you know you are interested to make a difference this is something I would really encourage you to look at is there is so you know but when you actually uh, you know look a bit deeper there is so many great opportunities to really build skills and to really work on exciting projects uh, and to really make a difference in the world using your skills and one other thing i would say is that it's it's become such a like a, a con more connected world in a way even though it's become we are all stuck in you know our own places uh and it's <laughs> it's been interesting to see how uh you know we are able to make so many more uh experiences 
experiences and introductions happen, like most of the conferences that were normally only available in person that you would have to travel to and spend so much, so many hours like getting to, you can actually uh, do like online now and often like they, they made them available for free. So, uh, and you, 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 can meet so many uh, very experienced and very uh, knowledgeable people there who can uh, be such a great asset, you know, both in terms of learning things and for your career development. And uh, yeah, I, I would say that has been invaluable for, for me personally and also for our company. And, uh, you know, it's it's been um, really a strange world, but at the same time, it, I felt that it did create this kind of shift in perspective and shift in mindset that uh, may make us, um, you know, re really, you know, from one, uh, from one side, it is very challenging, but for the other side, I think it, it kind of uh, creates new mindset and uh, helps people maybe in the long term make uh, much a better use of their abilities and learn from what makes you um, kind of uh, what, what are your strengths and how can you use them to make a more effective career decisions and decisions with uh, your skill set going forward. Okay. Thank you, Natalia. That was that was a really nice answer. Um, I would like to ask, you know, uh, going off of what Victor had mentioned earlier about, you know, really the importance of um, building meaningful relationships now more than ever. Um, while we're all in this virtual world, um, these are, you know, from, from being a professor and being, um, you know, a, a president and a CEO, how do you, you, you've seen the, the impact that personal relationships can, you know, have uh, in, in, in the workspace and, you know, building that, that connection with the person when you're in, you know, you meet them physically versus now doing all of this online. So from your experience, if you could potentially speak about, you know, your, um, uh, your, your experience and career and what you can learn from that, the importance of personal connection and how you can now try and engage that, you know, online. Well, it is one of the things I really missed as I began teaching this fall, actually being able to like have a coffee with a student in a way that wasn't particularly planned, but you know, we are in this world. And so we need to leverage uh, you know, what Zoom and other platforms let us do. And we have to be really deliberate because I find, you know, to meet new people, which is one of life's great opportunities is much harder, but it's not impossible. And it's almost like there's a way, I bet Natalia knows this piece. It's amazing who you can actually get 20 minutes of time on a Zoom platform that you'd probably never get in real life or it would take forever. So in a sense, people are more accessible, but the platform makes it more challenging to build a great human connection. But um, given that humans were really, I think, designed to have connections, we just have to, we have to muscle through this time. And, you know, I like Victor's uh, point about, you know, a thoughtful text is, you know, it can make somebody's day. And you can stand out, your thoughts can stand out in a way that, you know, they can probably stand out more quickly. And that's something to be really excited about. So it's almost like you gotta somehow we have to like leave the disappointment of, you know, my disappointment, I can't have coffee with you guys and say, yes, but we can actually move some things along. And some of the big structural things in life, like it's about time that lots of things about healthcare are digitized. Well, a lot of that's happening now. That's good. Great point, Lisa. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, Victor, from your perspective, you know, um, you mentioned that it's really important to build meaningful connections. And, and from what I understand, you also have a great network. And any tips on how students should, you know, really approach the entire networking conversation, which is a very big part of, you know, trying to find employment and meet the right kind of people, learning about the companies and roles. Like, how should a student or a young job seeking professional look at the process of networking now that it's all online? Because it's just not giving away, you know, 10 cards, 15 cards at a, at a conference. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, it's very interesting. I, I didn't, I never thought that giving away 10 or 15 cards was always that effective. You, you can build up a stack of cards after a conference. And if that's your measurement of success, I, I don't think um, that actually transfers to that meaningful relationship. But I think that's the point, right? And, and building on what Lisa was saying, you know, um, those relationships 
it, it, you know, all this stuff, if you go into any of the sectors, it's all about relationship. And when we look at Asia, uh, it's even more about relationships. It's high context cultures. It's, and so, you know, it's nice when you can fly over there where you can have, that's why, you know, a lot of business is done more in restaurants or, or at supper tables or over drinks than always in a boardroom because, you know, relationships really matter. And so it's that intentionality, it's that conscientiousness to also be deliberate, but also be, I think in this, in this very unique time, it's also being creative. And because people are all in this at the same time, and because everyone's, um, you know, their circumstances are different, I think there is opportunity one to, to reach out. As Lisa mentioned, there's access to people now that actually, um, you know, are on one spot at one time instead of circling around the world and, and may not have all the activities that they normally would have. And, and I do think everyone has a sense of, there's a sense of togetherness in terms of, you know, feeling the, the, the challenge of the situation. It doesn't matter if you're in, in Ukraine or if you're in Jamaica or if you are in uh, Vietnam or, or in Japan. Everyone around the globe, humanity is, is faced with this you know, significant challenge of this year. It affects everyone, of course, differently. Um, you know, those that have significant socioeconomic challenges, uh, those things have been uh, exasperated, but it is, it is something that, you know, everyone's, everyone's feeling uh, displaced. And so how do we go about, you know, making meaningful contact, um, actually finding things that we're appreciative of people, right? And letting them know that. Uh, one, two, finding things that they're interested in when you see an article that you go, wow, this would be, um, you know, very interesting to share because this is around the research that maybe Lisa's doing in terms of the course that she's teaching, passing that along. Uh, it's it's those you know those things that actually make a difference and you go wow, um, Grong, thank you so much you you made my day I, I never actually saw this article I never saw this piece and those things you know help build that relationship and I think sometimes you know I do it wrong when I'm saying I this is what I want now I want a job so I'm going to contact you you know you were valedictorian you know a lot of great graduates you were president of your uh, of your of your student society. But it's actually going the other way. And when I actually, when I see other people look to serve others, and and genuinely have interest in them, then it seemingly works a lot better. That's a great point, Victor. Um, and specifically to the fact that you know the this the, this tough situation and this adversity has brought everybody together. So really being empathetic towards what the other person would want, and how you could potentially help them, as opposed to seeing how you know um, you they they could help you. I think that's a great way of looking at it. Um, Natalia, with you're an entrepreneur, um, and I, you you also traveled uh, during the middle of a pandemic. Um, how how has that challenge changed for you in terms of you know potentially meeting VCs and you know raising money and having your teams together, spe specifically if say you were you know working in like a global setting because a lot of teams have also been doing remote work. Has that worked to your advantage in terms of recruiting and sourcing talent, or has that become a hindrance? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I, I mean, for us, we are a very international team from the start. So part of our team is actually in Asia and part of the team is in Canada. Uh, and so we had a bit of a head start, you know, in, in terms of uh, having uh, that kind of uh, workflow to be able to work together despite the time zone differences, despite the kind of all the challenges around that. Uh, and so it, it has been interesting, uh, you know, during uh, when the lockdown periods have started and, you know, all the meetings were basically made virtual and all the conversation with customers, with investors, with partners are now over Zoom. But it, 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 like, as was said previously, it's actually people are, you know, even kind of easier to reach in a way. Uh, and more willing because now you don't have to travel uh, to the meetings and you, you know it takes so much you, you can kind of pack so many more things into the schedule and people are actually more open to have those calls because they have that kind of flexibility uh, and uh, you know having, having talked to, to some of uh, our partners investors uh, as well as um, customers it has been actually kind of a relief, a relief for them as well in the sense that like the pandemic of course has been challenging but uh, they were able to um, you know make so much better decisions because they were able to kind of talk to more 
potential partners, more work startups in the case of the investors. And so um, I think it it has kind of changed people mindset in many ways. Like it's it's kind of like everyone talks about the new normal, right? And you know, if if you adapt your ways of working to this new changed kind of mindset of people, you can become so much better at, you know, building those relationships. And uh, given that people are actually calling in from their homes, you know, there is so much more room for making that personal connection, uh, you know, based, showing like a nice painting or somebody has in the, their background or, or something about their, the way that, <laughs> you know, their environment is organized. So it's, it's often, it's, it has been a very interesting change in, in, in that kind of um, uh, mindset and, and how we interact with people. Uh, and I think it actually, uh, if, if you, um, adapt to it well, it can create uh, really um, good opportunities uh, to uh, have uh, deeper relationships. And also in, in, the, in the case of the pandemic, you know, there, ha there has been, uh, the needs of people has been changing and there is so much opportunities to add kind of values through either your uh, skill set or your network or your knowledge in certain areas. So even though it might look like, you know, this, there is this big company and you're this little, like in our case, startup or, uh, you know, as a trying, you know, to, to find the opportunity or a job in, in, in a new context, uh, there, there's so much value you can add. So I would not underestimate that. Well, that's awesome. And I'm glad to hear that you were ahead of the curve in terms of adopting the Zoom culture and, you know, having a remote first uh, workforce. So, so it's a great work on that. Um, one question that I had, and this could, you know, uh, we could take this up for all three of you. Um, from a student perspective, now that you're looking to apply, say, internationally, and, you know, uh, we, especially for Canada, even as an international student who came here myself, there's a lot of focus on, um, you know, international mobility and international experiences, which makes a student stand out from, you know, the large application pool that you have. So, um, and some schools have now also removed the GMAT requirements that you had for say business school students specifically. Um, so Lisa, my question for you is in terms of these, these, these changing dynamics, how do you see um, say schools or educational institutes changing the way they assess students? So I'm not really sure, but I, I, I think what I would, what is more intriguing to me is the fact that everybody who's on this call is comes to it with a global perspective. And so I'm not really very good at how the various academic administrations work. But what I do observe about students is the ones who bring that global perspective are just way more open to the kind of opportunities that the world is presenting and are more able to see how they can actually bring their ideas to life. And so I think that, you know, to be interested in this youth council is just such a great demonstration of, you know, willingness to explore the world, willingness to see the world in all of its um, complexity. And, you know, I come at this with the bias that, I mean, the future of the world is in Asia. And, you know, it's incumbent on all of us to learn more and to, um, you know, see those, uh, those opportunities. Great. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, Victor, from, from your perspective, now that with things have changed, how do you, how do you see, you know, um, this potentially affecting the relationship between say Canada and India in terms of the number of students coming in, the number of the talent pool uh, and, and the intellect movement of, you know, intellect um, across the countries? Well, I think uh, we've actually seen quite a bit of momentum the last number of months. Um, you know, we had our, in October of, of this year, you know, we, everything's virtual now, so you can't do the normal conferences. And so in that way, you can actually sometimes shoot for the stars um, because you can never actually get some of the speakers you can get at one time on a virtual platform that you could get physically. And so we were all really concerned. You never know what, what is possible. And I'm you know, fortunate in our 38 year history as a council, uh, for the first time we had the, the current or acting prime minister of India speak to our council, 
right? And so all of a sudden we shot, we sent all these invites out. We got, you know, some of the most significant business leaders in Canada and in India, as well, of course, the prime minister of India, um, speaking directly to business leaders and government on both sides. And so there is, you know, if it's done well, if it's done at a high enough quality, there's great opportunity to leverage this. And so even as we plan out post pandemic, we're now actually budgeting to build in hybrid events that though we will have, you know, hopefully we'll get to a place with the vaccine that we can have physical events in place in the near future. We're now looking and seeing that we're going to have a virtual component to everything, right? If we can't get a certain speaker in, we're gonna, we're gonna bring them in. And also we have our stakeholders on both sides of the world that may not be able to fly over and we can now plug them in to the dialogue, to the conversations that are taking place virtually. So uh, I think it really changes the way in which we've done things, but it's also created opportunities that we probably uh, would not have ever imagined. And we've had engagement that we've, we've never expected as well. That's absolutely awesome. And I think um, a lot of the organizations are looking at a, a, a hybrid model, if not remote first and leveraging the fact that, you know, you can now have a virtual um, piece to every event and pull in resources, which were, which would have otherwise been unavailable. I think that's definitely a great thing that's come out of the pandemic. But, but, but um, let, let me just say though, you have to be very careful because everyone's doing so much virtual stuff now, right? Yeah. There's also, there's also, you know, uh, you know, what I call Zoom fatigue and, <laughs> and virtual fatigue. So, you know, us, you know, Lisa and I definitely enjoy getting out and, and interacting with people. And this is not the same, you know, it's a very different interaction looking at a screen for, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. And so we have to be very careful that we're, we're having a mix to those things um, in this because, you know, this is not our, our norm. And this is also um, you know, I, I think there's always going to be a component of it, but I think we have to be very um, selective on the activities, on the things that we do, because it, it, there's, you, can, you can literally sit on these kind of platforms for 24 hours a day, every day, and there's phenomenal content, phenomenal things you can take in, but can you actually compute that in? Can you actually execute on that? Can you actually um, build and deliver on that? And that's always a challenge, you know, when I'm accepting or not accepting the, the immense amount of wonderful opportunities that are taking place in the virtual world right now. I think that's a very good way of looking at it, like really looking at what the value add of each of these things could be potentially and using them in a manner to supplement the experience as opposed to, um, you know, substituting the experience. And I think that's, that's really important for all students also to, you know, look at in terms of attending events that would add value to what they want to do as opposed to just that there's so many things out there, really, really choosing that effectively. Um, so thank you for that, Victor. Um, Dalia, a question that I have for you is um, with, with this pandemic, um, employment has definitely been a concern for, you know, countries, for, for most countries and most students graduating at a, such a different time. Um, do you think that this is a great opportunity also for students to pursue entrepreneurship? Because if they were earlier scared or let's say hesitant in pursuing entrepreneurship because of the um, you know, potential challenges, but now that, you know, there aren't as many companies hiring in, in such numbers, uh, it also gives those students an opportunity who've always secretly wanted to take, take you know, jump into the, the opportunity um, of entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you for that. In fact, yeah, I have been seeing so many great uh, companies kind of, you know, in time of crisis is usually the, you know, the best uh, time also for innovation because you have so many problems that uh, originate in, in such a time. So, uh, you know, around, it has been really, you know, impressive to see around the world how many organizations have actually joined forces together to, you know, organize hackathons around a certain or idea zones around certain problems that they're finding in, in the healthcare field, in the, you know, logistics field, in the field of, uh, you know, making the processes even like from the kind of fintech space or real estate management space, how to make those operations more efficient, how to solve this uh, you know, crisis. There is so many uh, problems right now in the world that needs to be solved. Um, so I, I definitely think this is a great time to 
uh, you know, explore uh, those um, opportunities and also see how you can contribute because it's such a rewarding thing to do as well, um, both from learning perspective and building your skill set, but also actually helping, you know, talking to those uh, people who uh, might be having those challenges and helping them come up with solutions. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, been really interesting to see how many companies actually originated over the last few months and, you know, how successful they were in actually, you know, kind of quickly prototyping solutions and testing them and seeing what works and what doesn't and actually being really effective at, at bringing new kind of solutions to the market. Uh, so, yeah, I, I would really encourage everyone to, to think about this, especially if you had something that you were already thinking of launching. Of course, there is a, a additional challenges that right now we, we are facing because with, with some areas because of, you know, in our case, even, even though our solution has a um, kind of aspect of it that can solve the problems around spreading inf uh, to, to reduce the spread of infection inside the buildings. We, we are making a hardware product. So from uh, you know logistics perspective, it was uh, you know more difficult in a way to, to have those pilots, to have us uh, to have set up the distribution and installation of our sensors in the buildings and also in the transportation systems. So there is of course challenges to, to everything, but you know, we have learned so much about how to make this work remotely, uh, whereas before, you know, usually the standard way we were doing this is going into the actual place, installing it and testing it that way. So, yeah, I would say it's a great time to, to explore uh, startups and also uh, your ideas around this and uh, also uh, a great learning opportunity as well. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um... It's interesting because you also mentioned, you know, at the heart of every adversity lies that opportunity. And I think you need to have that kind of optimistic outlook um, to really you know, pursue that and, and, and look at it. Um, now I'd like to, you know, put all three of you on the spot and ask some tough questions, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll start with you, Lisa. What has been the biggest challenge that, you know, you've had to overcome professionally when you had to move to, you know, this virtual platform? And you had to do all of, you know, all of your teaching online and all of your work online. And how did you get yourself to adapt? And how did you get yourself to, you know, go through with it? Well, when I started to teach this fall was the first time I had taught a course. Yeah. I had, you know, come into classes, but, um, you know, it was, it was like, okay, I'm going to teach and I'm going to teach in a virtual sense. But I've always loved technology and I was kind of blown away at how much, how quickly one could learn how to do at least okay. And then from okay, you could start to get a little bit better. And you could also, like we said to the students in the first week, we're going to try new things and we probably won't be right every time. And I think that that's actually a really good message for business students to hear that, you know, it's unlikely in their careers that everything is going to go according to plan. Let's hope there aren't too many years just like this one in their lives. But it, it's been really exciting to see how the platforms have adapted and how people have figured out, um, like when I was getting prepared for the class and I was you know, quite intimidated by like, how will I make three hour blocks exciting? I started to think of it more as producing television and that it's not a lecture, it's break it down into chapters. And I thought of, you know, television producers that I had worked closely with and how they would be, you know, looking for graphics that would illustrate a given point and how would you, you know, draw in the audience. And so once I had that different framing of what teaching in a virtual setup was, it helped me think, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's a different way of doing something that people have done for years. And frankly, it's probably a more engaging way for the students. And so I always kept the students in mind. I'm like, okay, how can we make this great for them? That's incredible. And I, I love the analogy of looking at, you know, um, is this something that you're producing? And if as a television producer were to present this, how would, how would they really draw in that attention? That's, that's really interesting. Um, 
Victor, from your perspective, what was the most challenging thing that you had to overcome, you know, of, of being virtual and how did you kind of go about doing that? Right. So uh, uh, as mentioned, you, I, I took on this new role April 1. Yeah. And so uh, I was supposed to go to India in March. We were supposed to do our Bangalore forum. Everything was supposed to be, you know, well in, play, well in place. Um, budget was looking good. Everything was on track from the first quarter. And then all of a sudden, of course, March, our event got canceled. I started the role. And I started the role one, with us starting to bleed money. Two, that I, I was supposed to be in another city managing a team that I had not met or worked with. And then three, none of us could be together uh, in, in a physical sense. So um, it has been an, an incredible opportunity in terms of you know trying to pivot, trying to change, you know, a group that we we did so many things well for so long that were completely irrelevant to 2020. And so the, the team had to understand that, the team had to change, our stakeholders had to understand that someone was new in, that I was not able to come visit them in, in Mumbai, that uh, I'm going to reach out to them, you know, by phone or virtually or however they want to. And when one by one, as we got to take the time and, and connect with those key stakeholders, and understand, you know, where are things actually settling? You know, we, you know, even in April, we thought maybe we can do some in-person events by June. And then that got pushed out. And then we would say, we'd hope, we'd hope in the fall, everything would, you know, be normal and we'd be able to meet in a boardroom in downtown Toronto. And so as things have, have been unveiled in terms of the, the seriousness of the pandemic, in terms of the understanding, you just, you have to adapt, you have to go. And, um, you know, we also had to make some organizational changes because we didn't have the team that we needed for 2020. And, but as we started doing that, um, people started coming on side. So you need, to, you need to communicate a lot with those stakeholders. You need to ensure that um, they understand where you're coming from and your pressure points. And then you need to be able to deliver because you know, we couldn't sit pat and say, okay, we're just gonna wait out this, this year in terms of the relationship, in terms of the economic corridor. Because as you said, there's still a lot of students that are coming here. There's still a lot of trade that needs to happen. There's still a lot of our major institutional investors that are investing or and looking to invest billions into India. So how are we positioning ourselves and engaging them effectively that we're doing so in a meaningful way in 2020? And whenever this subsides, how do we actually propel ourselves to do even much more? And that's kind of now as we see, you know, uh, a change on the horizon in this upcoming year, how are we able to now you know, accelerate, catapult the work that we've been doing to do that much more because we've kind of lost some of the traditional time and efforts. But, but it's uh, it's been a very interesting and uh, unpredictable, but um, uh, fascinating learning in terms of, of in terms of this role in this year. That's awesome, Victor. That's a great answer, especially in terms of you know making making sure that you're communicating enough to make sure that everybody is on the same page. You're able to really you know, have that expectation setting um, done properly. So that's really helpful. Um, Natalia, what about you in terms of one of the most difficult things you've had to overcome during this um, virtual transition? Yeah, no, that's that's a really a, a great question. I mean, it made me think a lot. And there is actually a few things, you know. Uh, I would highlight three main <laughs> kind of challenges, actually. <laughs> One uh, is, you know, around, you know, this, uh, this whole new area of, you know, being a kind of a startup that uh, ra um, makes physical products and operating in, in a virtual world and figuring out how do you actually function in, in it, because we had we had a number of different pilots lined up both this fall and also still have planned in in the next year and we have been just like <laughs> changing our like whole processes and mindset about how to do it how to be able to make it really easier so it, I, I think it actually forced us to really think about the user experience the experience of products uh, of how people uh, um, uh, experience our product in, in a completely different way because you know we don't rely on us being there all the time and we have to kind of send in have have the things properly installed and how you know the the operations manage correctly and uh, especially right now as many you know like in the case of uh, real estate uh, world we have been getting more and more 
people interested in kind of commercial buildings, even though we initially started in kind of industrial kind of very <laughs> like um, spaces where um, you would not think about uh, a lot of this uh, Kind of softer things and how uh, people use the product we we have a lot more opportunities right now to think about you know uh, commercial buildings and how can we help them you know get people safely back into the spaces how can we get them to uh you know engage with this information and actually make changes that are effective that has been you know really beneficial for both us and the people we are speaking to on the second note we are also recruiting right and so the recruitment world has been really uh changing so much over the last um you know few months and uh, for us it's additional challenges because as i mentioned part of our team is in asia part of it is in in, in canada and so kind of uh we, we we don't really um, distinguish you know where where we recruit as long as it's a great person who is really you know uh, aligned with us on, on our vision it you know it doesn't matter for us where you where you're located but at the same time it you know there is this aspect of establishing trust and how to how do you evaluate you know how you well how well you would work together and that's you know usually we would like to have at least one meeting kind of in person with that person but now we have to switch that that recruitment uh, plan completely as well uh, and so that has been also quite a challenge and a learning experience uh, so yeah I, I would say it's it's definitely changed a lot of things that we are doing and also um, kind of the change in how we approach things and i would highlight like i guess the the biggest challenge is how uh, we um, present ourselves through this virtual means and how do we establish trust because you know we are so used to having people in the front of us and to judge those things but now we are just like boxes <laughs> with head inside them so it has been a kind of a different way to interact that's a great answer, Natalia, and it's a perfect segue. So uh, I'm going to open up the floor to the audience for questions, and we've received two incredible questions, so we'll go around the table. Um, going off of what Natalia was just mentioning, um, the question from the audience member is, um, what tips do you have uh, for building trust virtually? So, Lisa, we, we'll start with you. So I don't think we know, and... I think being deliberate and thoughtful about how you're going about the communication. So like sometimes a phone call is a good idea. Sometimes a text is a good idea. Sometimes a big Zoom call with a bunch of people is. But to really think before you set up the Zoom call. And I suspect that when one makes a commitment in the virtual world, it's super important to keep it. You know, that you can't kind of just glide into someone's office and say, oh, you know, I'm going to be, you know, another 10 hours before I get your response. It, it's in the virtual world. I think our expectations are more rigid. And, you know, that makes, you know, trust gets built up by keeping commitments. That's perfect. Thank you, Lisa. Um... Victor, any any thoughts? I I think Lisa kind of you know hit it really well. The, the the deliberate and thoughtful, and I would just add that um, you know really understanding where the other person or that relationship is coming from, in terms of you know, right, and then and then thinking through, uh, as she just mentioned, what's the best way to right. Sometimes it's actually you know unheard of now, but to actually send a handwritten note <laughs> to someone in the midst of everything and to be able to actually get that. Uh, I just received something on Friday and I, it meant so much to me because you, you rare, like they actually tracked me down to see where I am right now, sent it to this address. And I was like, that's so kind, right? To see a personal handwritten note. And so I think, I think that's um, extremely important. And then also just to what Lisa was saying is in terms of being prepared. Um, being prepared to, you know, it's funny, you, you could show up to a meeting previously and you could be 10 minutes late, but sometimes now you show up to a Zoom uh, conference or event and you're two minutes late and it feels like you were half an hour late. And so it's, the expectations are, are kind of um, compacted 
and it is it is that much more to be able to um i think under promise and over deliver <laughs> uh in this world because it's so easy just to get filled up and not you know not schedule time to actually take time for yourself not schedule time to go to to use the washroom uh for sitting on a, on a call for three and a half hours again not practical but sometimes i i tend to do that more than not and then i'm i'm you know wondering why i'm i'm jumping onto the next zoom call and i haven't eaten anything the whole day so is that going to be my my best self is that going to help you know am i my prepared um physically emotionally mentally for that those next three meetings in a row maybe not and so you know little things that i do is make sure i have i i'm well hydrated i'm i have snacks around that in between i can do those things but it's it's a very it's a very different world uh, than it was before and people also are much more casual uh, sometimes with their dress and they also sometimes then are more casual with their discussions and i think being prepared um you know you don't have to you don't have to be wearing a tuxedo but but being being on top of things from a professional standpoint i think never hurts absolutely thank you victor um that those are great points um so Natalia, you've you've already kind of touched upon this, so I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. Uh, and this was something that came up in our conversation with other members of the uh, foundation, the youth council members. Um, do you ever find that the way you present yourself, male, female, ethnicity, dress, height, etc., has affected you in the job market? And do you feel that being virtual or working from home um, will you know change uh, the way that you know you're perceived? Because everybody is now in the same frame. Right, and you can't see how large or how small a person is, and how that could potentially, you know, work into the unconscious bias that a person may have against somebody else. Um, do you do you find that, or something that you've you've uh, you know experienced? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the first impressions matter, right? Like that's how you know, uh, like it or not, that's how people make the. Uh, judgments and uh, and so the you know the zoom world really changed uh, a lot of things i mean we are not we don't see what is the height of the person or really like what what they're wearing like there has been so many cases in the zoom when uh you, you, actually the person was, was like looked very different from the top from then uh, the rest of the their outfit so yeah it's it's such a interesting world right now as as a lot of those biases um, that people would make about a person based on their height or other factors would not exist. And at the same time, it's so important to make the, still the right impression because you know what what is behind you in your background really becomes really <laughs> important because you that's what you're looking at for the whole you know 60 minute Zoom call. And so uh, making that decisions about how you present yourselves, what kind of information you share with people about your surrounding, and how professional that is. Uh, you know, becomes a really critical factor. So I, I would say both. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting how some aspects of uh, you become less relevant, and some of the kind of factors become more relevant. Uh, like, for example, it I think it has kind of erased a lot of um, uh, judgments about. Um, some aspects of appearance that you don't see during the Zoom calls, but at the same time, it has created an emphasis on other, on how you present yourselves, uh, you, yourself in this, uh, in this environment. Uh, so, and you know, it it has been also kind of challenging from one perspective that often um, you don't uh, like like some in some calls that I have been in like with with some of the big you know like we have a corporate client or something and sometimes nobody has their videos on and you you're presenting and you you're the only one who has uh, anything like uh, kind of visible in the Zoom uh, world but at the same time you, you know so it makes it very challenging to judge perceptions because some people you know they when there is a power imbalance especially and they feel like they're kind of um, maybe meeting you and they have the power over uh, kind of interviewing you or working with you as uh, and they have that kind of leverage uh, so that has created um, you know new you have to kind of get a sense of where they're coming from and maybe ask them more questions throughout the process of talking to them to get a sense of what they are thinking. 
Um, but yeah, it's, I, I would still suggest that it's a good idea to, you know, um, have your videos on and make that kind of an example so that, uh, you know, you, you, you create that kind of precedent for them uh, to, to share that as well and to, to have that kind of right. conversation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Um, Lisa, what are your thoughts on that? So, Garang, I wondered whether there is an emerging um, protocol on leaving your videos on. Like when we talk about how do we build relationships, it's kind of hard when you can't look at see the, the other person. person. Yeah. <laughs> or when like partway through they turn on, they turn off their, their camera and you're like, okay, what did I do? Um, but I am interested in whether people think that there is an emerging uh, norm or we're still kind of just in a, you know, a thousand different approaches to this thing. Right. Because this conversation came up because um, um, one of, um, you know, my female colleagues, she mentioned that when she was having a salary negotiation, uh, potentially, you know, the, the way you present yourself in person versus you would on Zoom, if you're, say, relatively not as, you know, not as tall, um, not from say a certain ethnic background, it might work against you because of those biases, unconscious biases that people might have. But now that you're doing everything virtually, it is it is very different. Yeah, I mean there is a certain equalization, and certainly when it comes to height, we don't know yeah. who's tall and who isn't. Yeah. Um, but but I I think all of those discussions are still challenging ones, and to have them virtually um, requires a lot more resources, like inner resources to feel that you're getting your points across when it's like something as important as, you know, negotiating salary. I mean, that, those are the things that, that they're tough at the best of times and to make them on Zoom, I think is, uh, we just may as well recognize there's some things that are difficult. Perfect. Perfect. Victor, your thoughts? I, I think Natalia and Lisa have answered this uh, very well. Uh, I, I do think, you know, there is, you know, what you're presenting now in a little box is what you're presenting. And so to be conscientious of that, you know, I've, I've heard if you have a black, I mean, a blank background, people kind of go like, you know, you're not showing any of your personality, you're not showing any life, you're not doing anything. And if you have, you know, a beautiful, um, you know, you're sitting on the beach in terms of the virtual background, then is that appropriate for, you know, so it's, there's so many different um, aspects to all this. And to Lisa's point, there's, there's no norms yet. There's no, like, like, this is all happening in fluid times. And so, you know, I, I do think that hopefully, you know, in a perfect world, we're focused on the character of the person and the content of what they're sharing. But I do think it actually, you know, brings about like, for example, with Natalia, she even put her email on there. She's saying she's hiring and she's got her email on her background. And so what a what a fantastic like I cannot miss who you're with, uh, you know, how to get a hold of you. And so, you know, it's there, there's so many more unique. And again, I think that's where the creativity comes in. How do we actually express ourselves that we can't do it uh, physically in person? But we can we can possibly do that now in a virtual world, and and I think we have there's there's greater and greater opportunities to do that. But I look at Natalia um, as you know doing a very good job of promoting herself and her company, and as she's saying to recruit those that are looking for jobs, uh, th there's her email. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I just want to um, I know we're, we're right on time, so I just want to thank all three of you for an incredible discussion and for you know uh, being being with with us here today. Uh, and just to wrap up for all the students, I think some of my key takeaways are uh, maintaining that positivity during this time, making you know reaching out, making those genuine connections, but also being cautious of the fact that you're not overstretching yourself and just you know attending everything that there is out there being being deliberate being patient and being resilient i think would um, would basically sum this up for me um, and thank you once again everybody this has been an absolute absolute pleasure thanks Corinne. thank you so much thank, thank you very you. much it was great